Hello guys, happy new year and welcome back to Not Just Mecha. It's Marco here and today we speed paint in high quality a big dragon. If you are like me, after the holidays you have a bunch of new grey plastic on the table and a ton of crazy ideas in mind. So let's stretch the speed painting muscles to jumpstart the new year of modeling with a simple project and a good dose of instant gratification. Even if uh, this looks like a complex paint job, this uh, big guy took me less than 5 hours of work. Sure, the model is huge, with a lot of large open surfaces full of details. But even in uh, the official box art, when it comes to colors, you can see that the scheme is based on just uh, two main tones, with a splash of gold on the few pieces of the armor. So the real amount of visual information to deliver is uh, quite contained and simple to plan out in advance for maximum efficiency. And frankly, these big, organic, flowing shapes make it quite easy and forgiving to handle, especially when you have me showing you all the crazy shortcuts and dirty tricks. Don't forget to drop a like to help the diffusion of this video and the channel, and of course subscribe to join my painting journey in every corner of the hobby. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page, where you can find articles, extra material, and the real-time footage of my videos, with every single little line and brushstroke. Thanks a million, guys! I start immediately cutting a big boring corner. We tend to put the priming stage into the same realm of building, cleaning and preparing the model for painting, but since there are paints and colors involved, I consider it as the first stage of my painting process, and I always adapt it to the needs of the result I want to achieve. Here I want to push on the richness, depth and general complexity of the local colors, so a black base would not be an ideal starting point for a progression based on vibrancy and flowing highly chromatic shades, but I can still use a relatively dark value as a starting point for the general contrast and all the value modeling of the three-dimensional shapes. From the chromatic point of view, I use violet because it's a warm hue that will create a nice contrast with the cold tones I use in the lights to sell the idea of the late winter, early spring setting but not too warm, to avoid putting you off from the idea of the general cold environment. And at the same time, it's a great foundation both for a progression into orangey skin tones and moving on the other side of the color wheel, blue hues, a classic win-win-win situation. And I prime the base in black, because it is a great base for the greyish rubble and stones, and the stark contrast I imagine between the ground and the white snow. I start building up the progression for wings and softer skin using a natural brownish red. It's a short, gentle step into warmer and lighter territories, and I apply it in a loose way to let some of the violet show through this layer. This creates the base for a realistic random pattern, especially on the wings. And since I'm working with highly covering opaque paints, I can extend a bit the edges of this application to be sure to frame well all the areas of light skin, and then maybe shrink them later with the covering blue layers. With the next application, I keep climbing the chromatic and value scale using a deep warm orange. Every new layer is less and less solid and opaque to keep the information of all the tones underneath, quickly building up a ton of visual complexity. At this point of the channel's life, this probably doesn't need to be said, but every video is someone's first video, so I want to point out that uh, this whole process is not about uh, specific tools and paints, but about tones and how they are interacting, so you can totally do the same with a soft dry brushing for example or a light, semi-transparent layering with a brush. The most interesting bit here is uh, the patchy application on the wings that I use to simulate the regular thickness of this uh, stretch skin and the different levels of transparency that uh, let you see some of its depth against the imaginary light and maybe the blood running underneath. I 
I close the initial phase of this progression with the yellow sand tone that keeps uh, pushing the same ideas of the previous layers into slightly lighter values and much stronger yellow sensations. This step is here more for tones than values, and later the skin will get a couple of extra layers that will provide a more powerful luminosity, but they will be more efficient and they will look better if layered in between this base and the blue parts of the skin. The chromatic jump on the color wheel between violet and blue is short and safe, so I can translate it in a quick single step. The two main blocks of colors are extremely different, but since I'm working on continuous, flowing organic shapes, I can safely overlap them on the edges with a light faded application. And again, they start from the same base tone, so there is always that common root, adding some passive harmony. And with a similar delicate touch, I can simulate the effect of the bluish bones appearing through the skin of the wings. Even if uh, subtle and localized, the contribution of violet is still there, as a gentle modulation of the dark parts. And I go back to the soft skin to jump into the extreme lights with a warm light of white. I lose a saturation to get luminosity, but soon you'll see how this choice fits into the bigger plan and how at the end I get both to their maximum levels. This step is also useful to soften even more the transitions between the colder and warmer skins. I follow this idea to its natural consequence, using white ink as my extreme point of light on every single high volume exposed to high or direct zenithal light and of course to set in place the annoying clean white elements of the armor. Now I can finally unveil the full blueprint of my plan. This is basically a new take on the idea of value sketching that I started testing during these holidays. In this initial stage I have two main objectives set the foundational progression and literal macro shapes of the main blocks of colors, and push the values to their extreme upper limits, so that in a second phase I can follow these uh, shapes and steps backwards, painting the shadows with uh, super saturated tones and getting a full value sketch made with a ton of complex vibrant colors. Mm, I'm afraid to sound like Christopher Nolan explaining the plot of Memento. But first I want to set the metallic parts, so they can also benefit from the shading stage. The only solution to get the colorful shiny yellow gold I have in mind is to create my own specific gold, simply by mixing a light neutral silver with a good amount of pure yellow ink. The fluid consistency of the mix makes it easy to move around complex shapes, and it sticks to the model like a marker. Plus, with a couple of coats I get the full shine of the metallic pigments, boosted by the glossy finish of the ink, that together catch light like real metal. From this uh, general high point I can go down in the value scale, describing better all the little shapes with a fine and controlled modeling of the fake light over the sculpt. The beauty of using a transparent paints at this stage is that they will react in different ways with all the colors underneath, creating a ton of exponential complexity in a single phase. A color like Rosienna can boost the red sensations of the first application, 
bringing out at the same time the yellow tones of the intermediate volumes of the soft skin. And because of that high content of yellow, the other spray creates a subtle green shade on the edges of the blue scales, because of the optical mix created by their overlap. I follow this tendency of the blue skin, moving into phthalo green yellow shade, that pushes on the warm green yellow shades of this part of the skin. I want this stage to be controlled and progressive on the whole model. So, to avoid losing sight of the general picture, I move back and forth between the two blocks of colors. A darker and more reddish brown is what I need to follow my steps back on the color wheel. Following this same idea, I use phthalo green blue shade to move the green sensations into a colder spectrum. And then turquoise to properly enter into the blue territory. Again, you can obtain the same result using controlled washes or transparent filters with the brush. You just need to start from extremely light values to have all the space to tone them down with a bunch of interesting colors. To go back to the very first warm tone of this non-linear progression, I use a light magenta on everything to reinstate and enhance this subtle warm bridge linking the two extremely different parts of the scheme. And with this foundation in place, I can close the shading with a proper dark violet, to finally mark the lowest and darkest point for now, of my general contrast. In the opposite way of the first opaque application, I lose a bit of luminosity to get extra tones and saturation, but again, this is totally part of the plan. I need that potential space to work on the light definition with the brush, so I can switch the blurred extreme high values with sharp and controlled extreme high values. But first, I have to take care of the macro smoothness of all my micro progressions, and even more important, of all the sharper dark definition. And this is a work for oil paints. Since I don't want them to affect too much the general tones, I seal the model under a coat of satin varnish. I never really use varnish for protection and its main use in my workflow with oils is to control their behavior and the impact on the previous acrylic layers. Matte varnish where I want a strong, diffused, gritty adhesion, gloss varnish where I want precise panel lines and sharp localized effects, check this video up here, and satin varnish, well, when I need uh, something in between. <laughs> The oil palette, and frankly the whole process, is extremely simple and fun. I use a dark mix of black, brown and magenta as a light, thin, translucent filter over the whole warm skin. And I start removing the excess with dry makeup sponges as soon as the solvent is evaporated, let's say 10-15 minutes after the application.
and I do the same on the cold skin using a mix of black and blue oil paint. I kept the two stages separated only because this model is huge and working on a single color at the time the process is less messy and easier to handle on the table. The tangent movement of the dry sponge takes off the excess, leaving a good amount of paint even inside the most shallow details, and it works at the same time like a blending brush, spreading paint around in a gentle, uniform way. I use precisely this idea after the first application and clean, when I apply the warm mix into the deeper shapes and under the lower undercuts, to enhance the color pattern set from the beginning. And thanks to these uh, huge volumes, I can use the sponge like a big soft brush to hide and soften the transitions. And here is my favorite step. A dry sponge can take off only a certain amount of paint, and a lot of color is only spread on the model, as a super thin transparent layer, but it is still there. It remains on the surface because of the satin varnish and its intermediate ability to absorb and retain paint, and in part simply because if you really want to remove solvent-based paint, well, you need the solvent. So I use Q-tips, slightly damped in white spirit, to clean small localized areas, basically obtaining an extra highlight, but removing shadows instead of painting lights. Even cooler. I can also create strange, complex effects, simply moving around the thin layer of active paint. Check these streaks on the wings. Again, make sure to start from a high point of luminosity, to have the space to play with all these dark effects. After all this cleaning, the raised details and all the flat, open parts are completely oil-free. And since the last stage is all about extreme high values and edge highlights, I don't have to wait for the oils to be dry, and I can move to the wet palette immediately. Even my acrylic palette is extremely simple, because with all this overlapped and intertwined complexity, I don't have the need to do anything crazy. I use uh, three light skin tones for the work on the warm side plus a dark brown if I need to fix or sharpen something in the shadows, and four tones for the cold skin that cover the light spectrum between green and blue. Yeah, and the pastel violet, because it seems that recently I feel the need to sit on the palette, but it will be useful to bring a bit of subtle, transitional warmth in some of the mixes. The work at this point is uh, that simple and incredibly quick, but the results it delivers on the tight pattern of the scales is so amazing that it becomes almost a joke. The only thing I do is to quickly and roughly frame every scale inside its own perimeter. When said this way, it seems like a very long and tedious work, but the secret is that I'm painting rough, living, organic materials so painterly, super quick and honestly sometimes almost random brushstrokes are perfect both to sell the illusion of this specific snake skin texture and to drastically cut the working time. For example, this is literally all I do on the wings. Single, semi-transparent, sketchy lines that roughly follow the vertical pattern of the wings and their folds and wrinkles, and it's enough.
as always, the trick is to guide the eyes on the areas that you want as your focal points, so you can use your time in more efficient ways, investing extra meaningful work only on the elements that really matter. The work on the back, lower part of the legs is extremely quick and dirty, for example, a stage of really a couple of minutes. But I want natural focal points like face and upper torso to be extremely sharp and well rendered. They still maintain some of the general roughness that a reptilian skin deserves, but I use one or two extra lights, both to make it more detailed and to push on the idea of a natural higher light. Similar idea in the back. I add one or two extra lights on scales and muscles above the shoulder blades to establish a stronger contrast, a more progressive gradient for the light, and a more in focus image of the part. But everything else is defined by a simple, irregular, thin line around the edges. I honestly cannot imagine a better visual example of my view on speed painting, where the result should be much greater than the sum of its simple parts. Same attitude working on the definition of the metallic armor. I use a single light gold straight from the pot to add edges, little cuts, dents and fine battle damages with short thin brush strokes, and these simple touches add a whole new dimension and sharpness to all the cumulative work of the previous stages. And here is the final result. Five hours of work for one of the biggest GW creatures of the last few years, a ton of relaxing fun perfect for the winter holidays, and more important, a new alternative chromatic take on quick value sketching, that now I really want to test under different starting conditions, and on several different sizes and scales, because I believe it can be pushed into interesting new territories. The visual complexity you can obtain with this uh, fluid back and forth of tones and values is amazing. Even before oils and the work on the wet palette, I have in place more than a dozen of different tones, applied in the most obvious and simplistic way, but working in a deep, final, harmonious concert. So stay tuned, because uh, this will be an interesting year. If you like this video, give it a like and subscribe. Remember that you can ask me anything down below with a comment, and you can follow my projects during the week using one of my socials. And if you want to support my work, check my Patreon page and join the community, or maybe ask for a commission. See you next week, guys!